Thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremony. First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this Malaysian Democracy Forum for having invited me to speak to you all this evening. And uh, I knew this forum, I believe this forum is actually attempting to address some aspects of the practice of democracy in Malaysia, particularly with events which happened very recently. But uh, I have to take a much broader outlook at the evolution of democracy in Malaysia, because to understand what's happening now, you have to understand the past, from where we came and how we evolved. And in so, in doing so, in, uh, doing so I'll try to look at it from a few pertinent points. One, of course, is to address this one issue, one issue is whether the element of race in the practice of democracy in Malaysia, to what an extent it is deeply involved, and it is possible for us to look for a day in which Malaysian politics or the practice of democracy in this country will be done without the threat of race running across it. The second issue which is fundamental to democracy in Malaysia is the aspect of uh, coalition power politics of multiple parties getting together and try to address whether this has been a successful model in an efficient model to be able to actually ensure that all components of the coalitions are successful. First, let me look at how political parties in Malaysia evolved historically to understand how it came and how it came about. And uh, the origin of politics in Malaysia in the current form, that is the formation of parties as such, goes back maybe to the time just after the Japanese occupation in Malaysia in 1945. The Japanese occupation actually played a big role because one, Japanese were anti-British, so they actually managed to implant nationalism within Malaysians against the British. And that actually evoked the spirit of nationalism within Malaysians to fight British. And towards this end, when the British came back after 1945 and proposed a kind of new concept called Malayan Union, which in literal words will put Malaysia as a British colony, this was something which was objected seriously by Malay politicians of those day, Malay leaders of this day, because politics was not evolved, Malay leaders of that day, in terms of grassroots leaders, linguistic leaders, educational leaders, leaders in the grassroots, and uh, that was actually lad, and, who, and there was a man who managed to bring them together in the form of Dr. Onin Brinja Jaffa, who is the grandfather of the, of, uh, the current uh, defense minister, and who managed to actually bring them together and actually oppose the Malayan Union, oppose the Malayan Union, and in that galvanizing Malay support together, and that actually eventually led to the formation of AMNO or the United Malaysian National, Malayan National Organization. So in essence, it was why they did this, it was felt that the Malayan Union was a threat to the whole identity of the Malays, the culture, the rulers, and the practice of the religion itself. So because of that, there was a need to, coer to bring the, the, the Malays together to oppose it, and which started as a social organization, eventually became a political organization. And when this happened, what was happening was, during the Japanese occupation and post it, communism was coming up in China, and the communist fire in China was spread into Malaysia through the Malaysian Communist Party. And uh, the Chinese, particularly those in the rural areas, were actually sympathetic to the Communist Party, and there was a need to, to have an opposing stand to this, and with that evolved the Malaysian Chinese Association, which actually thought that it could represent Chinese ideals, make sure that the Chinese community doesn't actually fall into the faults of the Malaysian Communist Party. And in response to the plan which the British did, whereby they decided to actually remove those Chinese who were living in the fringes of 
the forests and were actually supporting the communists for their daily survival and putting them into new villages which are still existing today as Kabun Barus in many, many cities in, the town, in, the, in Malaysia. Uh, and so that this support element is not there. And this group of people were actually dislocated from their current locations to new places needed support. And the MCA came forward to actually give the support. And that caused the formation of the MCA in 1949. Likewise, India was undergoing a major nationalistic movement fighting against the British. And that movement actually spread to Malaysia and some Malaysians became interested in supporting that. And through their support actually evolved the Malaysian Indian Congress, which is actually very, very similar to the Indian National Congress. So, so that nationalism actually was part of the evolution of the Malaysian Indian Congress and in fact some of the earlier leaders of the MIC were also represented in the Indian National Congress in those days. And as time goes by, of course, MIC became more local and decided to look at the politics of the local. So this is how the evolution was going. The one interesting point happened as this evolution was going and uh, Everybody knew that Malaysia, because after the contest by AMNO, the British dropped the idea of Malayan Union and came out with the suggestion of a federation of Malaya. And as this was going and negotiations to get independence was going on, the same person who formed AMNO, this is a very important point, the same person who formed AMNO had a self-realization that we need a multiracial approach to the future of this nation. And he actually formed a multiracial party called the Independence of Malayan Party. But, and uh, very, very interestingly, in the first form of local election which happened here in Kuala Lumpur in 1952, Auno and MCA, not formally, just had an electoral pact between themselves, contested the election, and the Independence of Malaysian Party, supposed to be multiracial in nature, also contested the election. The collision of race parties won nine of the 12 seats which were contested and the multiracial party only won two of the seats. From then it was seen that a collision of racial parties is a solution to Malaysian politics and multiracial power parties did not get the traction of the people. And this continued to go on and when the next election, which is the first election, we call the general election, when the uh, for under the Federation of Malaya in 1955, where the alliance won nearly 51 or 52 or 54 seats which were contested. Again showing by then MIC had joined the alliance. So collision of race parties and IMP actually did extremely poorly. So again and again it was re-registered that the collision of race-based parties were more successful than multiracial parties in that context of the Malaysian nation. So that gave rise to the evolution of the three major parties which historically have been there. Of course, as time goes by, some other parties came in different times responding to different things. And another period which was very, very interesting, which was very, very important in Malaysian politics, which led to the formation of new parties was when Malaysia was formed in 1963 and in between Malaysia's formation and the expulsion of Singapore in 1965, when uh, Malaysian politics became very, very hot. Very, very hot, and there were challenges to very, very fundamental issues. The National Language Act which was formed, where from English, there's going to be a total transfer to the Malay language in every possible, from education to official acts and all. So when Singapore came in, of course, Singapore fought on an agenda which was called the Malaysian Malaysia, uh, Ma uh, Malaysian Malaya, Malaysian Malaysia agenda, based on a more equal state. And as this was going on hotter and hotter, of course, eventually led to the expulsion of Singapore in 1965. Then what happened eventually was these groups of people, the remnants of well, the PAP, which contested in 1964 in Malaysia, also didn't do well. But later, after the expulsion became the DAP, still championing the idea of the Malaysian Malaysia. And along with other parties, with, and that also led to the formation 
of another party, the Garakan, contesting of leftist groups like Labour Front and Socialist Front, again fighting for, so that the battle was there in a very important part of Malaysian history when from independence the nation was forging to get an identity linguistically and otherwise and the opposition to this forged these things and this fervor, this fire was the one which went forth towards the very famous or infamous 1969 elections and the subsequent May 13 incidents which are important landmarks in the history of Malaysia. So what, so that gave rise to a new group of parties. So later on in history of course you have seen other parties being formed. But from all this what evolution of the political party system, there were race-based parties, there were multiracial parties opposing the racial parties which eventually also got racial identity to themselves and truly multiracial parties actually found it hard to survive. It was then, whether as the time has changed now, it's a difficult question to answer, but it's not, not very clear whether the appetite on the ground in Malaysia and the political culture has evolved to an extent to actually accept multiracial parties as the thing. The second issue which we need to look at is the aspect of why coalition politics has always been very successful. I already told you how our alliance or the initial alliance was more successful than attempts to form the, the parties which were essentially singularly formed with the idea of projecting a multiracial image. After May 30, 1969, one important political development was, because what happened in May 30, 1969, the elections was, Alliance lost its two-third majority. They lost the state of Penang uh, to Garakan. They lost the state, uh, state of Perak. Selenga was hung. Nobody was a winner. So in that situation, of course, after May, there was an emergency. Parliament was suspended. And... Uh, and uh, it took about two years before Parliament came back again. That time, the Prime Minister, that at for that particular time, Tunabul Razak, realized the need to actually bring more stability to the country. So, in order to bring more stability, the coalition was broadened, broadened to incorporate some of these parties, which actually won in Perak those who join in Penang, so that his collision will become stronger. In essence, that happened when Garakan joined alliance, the uh, PPP joined alliance, even the PAS joined alliance, and with that, many of the states became more stable, Salama became more stable, Parak became more stable, national government had more seats, there was greater political stability, Post-1969, in the aftermath, when the mood of the people after that very tragic incident was more want to be reconciliatory to try to form a nation which can move forward. So this is how coalition parties were formed and why in each and every election the results were in favor of coalition parties against any independent party trying to win an election. So against that background, I'll touch later of the, the processes which occur within these collisions and whether these collisions actually have been successful or not in forging the fundamental ideas which is supposed to do. So while well, we understand why collision parties are formed, it is also now need, and to, need to understand two other events which, ha two, I'm going to take two events which happened within the country to show the dynamics of the political process in the country and the consequences of it depending on how the scenario is. The first event is of course the 1969 elections and what happened after that. For those of you who are Malaysians, you'll know that. For the others, we might not. 1969 elections were fought. It's a very heated election. 
where race-related issues were actually here debated very hotly. And uh, the results in which the Alliance Party did, didn't do very well, as I said just now, they had a hung state assembly in Slango, virtually lost Para, lost Penang, lost Kelantan to pass, and they lost the two-third majority. Against this background, because of very provocative racial fervors which were occurring on either sides, we had a r riots which were unprecedented in our history, and as a result of these riots, a lot of people died, properties were damaged, and as a response to this, parliament was suspended, emergency was declared, functions were divided between the National Operations Council and the cabinet, and uh, this scenario went on till the Prime Minister of the day, Tunk Abdul Rahman, eventually resigned, and his deputy took over, and then uh, later, when parliament was started, a lot of important, significant changes happened in the social, cultural, and other aspects of Malaysia. One, of course, constitutional amendments were brought forward, in which many aspects which were considered sensitive, like those pertaining to the rulers, that pertaining to language, those pertaining to Malay rights, were put above questioning through the Seditious Act and amendments to the parliament. So there was this restrictions came on. Next, what happened was uh, a new economic policy was formulated in which there was an attempt to restructure the economy to rectify what was perceived as racial imbalances and to put right uh, uh, eradicate poverty and then identify that national unity at its weakest level, uh, uh, a national policy of forging national unity was formed. So these major things, the effects of many of which last till today, actually started after that very important 1969 elections. Now that, in, that was an election if you I'd look at the reasons why these problems came, you will know the fundamental aspect here was race. One was the Malays and politics of the Malays, and the other was the perception that the, among the Chinese community and the non-Malay community of perceptions of inequality wanting to greater usage of the languages and this battle which went on in 1969 because it involved major groups of people, racial base, the government actually responded saying that the, the situation is very hot, that we need to quieten it by suspending parliament and all forms of political activities. Taking it another scenario is which happened in 2018, which is actually politically more serious than the other one, in which the government actually lost, lost the federal government, lost many more state governments than it ever lost before in its history. But transition of power was done, although there were initial challenges, maybe for a few hours, just after the results were announced, or maybe one or two days. But transition of power act occurred, Smoothly, there was no such events which happened on the ground. And uh, a new government was formed. Why was this so? Why was it in one incident, just losing a simple majority, landed up in the suspension of parliament and a creation of emergency, whereas in the other incident, entire government was lost and many states were lost yet transition of power was done in a smooth manner. To understand this, you must see, recognize the players who were involved in this. In the first session, in the first one in 1969, it was a racial play. Because it was something which involved two different racial groups fighting against very fundamental issues. 
So that actually led to that instability which required the government of the day to ensure peace to do that. Whereas in 2018, in essence, the players were Tun Mahathir, Mohidin, and DAP against Dato Sri Najib. So in short, it was Tun Mahathir versus Dato Sri Najib. The forces behind the election, in, in 1969, the forces behind elections were elections pertaining to, to fundamental rights, Malay rights, linguistic rights, Whereas in 19, 2018, it was more global social issues. It was one MDB. It was fair elections. It was corruption. These were factors which actually affected everybody. Which, so it didn't have a racial bias. Because it didn't have a racial bias, even though the election results were worse to the Barisa National, yet the transition of power occurred because it would not have been possible to get traction of the ground to do otherwise, number one. And number two, the institutions of the government, like the police and army and other organizations, were committed to ensure this transition of power because they felt that's the result of a democracy in an election in which we fought because and the issues which were related to it. Subsequent to it, a, a, a Pakatan Harapan government, which actually won a simple majority, they had a comfortable simple, simple majority, but why they couldn't hold on the majority and continue ruling, this is another question which we had ourselves. One, of course, is the internal mechanisms within Pakatan Harapan itself, on the uh, succession of leadership and the inability to manage that, that could be one reason where inability to manage the succession of leadership which happened within the Pakatan Harapan. But beyond that, why it happened, the, to me, there are two reasons. One was Tun Mahathir's perpetual obsession that Pakatan Harapan did not have sufficient Malay support. Because when he had this perpetual obsession that Pakatan Harapan did not have money, which is in essence true, because if you take the election results as so, the Malay votes were split in 2018. And I think Pakatan could have got anything from 30 to 40 percent of Malay votes only. So being such so, his obsession that Pakatan Harapan did not have sufficient Malay support. And then the purported successor to him which he has already defined as not having Malay support also. So these were two important factors. One, which didn't actually allow for that succession to occur as it was planned. And number two, an attempt by Dr. Trudemate to continuously try to bring in Malay support into the system to create a stability which he thinks is sufficient enough for the government to run. Of course, this attempt was made through getting MPs from other parties, including AMNO, to cross over, which happened to some degree, but didn't happen to the number which he probably would have been comfortable with. It. So while was this battle was going on, this entirely destabilized the leadership structure of Pakatan Harapan, which eventually led to its fall. This is something, ideally, a party which has won, which has got a reasonably comfortable majority, not like what is happening now. Now it's like living from day to day because it's the, the, the structure of the parliament now is so fragile that every morning you can wake up to think what will happen the next day. But it was not so because of the inability to manage this, these forces, one of course, the manage their internal mechanism of their leadership. And number two is, of course, this idea that Pakatan Harapan support base did not come for the Malay base, and how can you actually strengthen to make it stronger was something which is going on and on. And because of that, eventually that led to this stability, and of course that lost to the loss of the government. So in all this, what you will, you will see, 
that the threat of race continuously started to play as early as 1945 till today. And when the argument goes that whether we can actually look forward for a day in which Malaysian politics will be devoid of that, to me, I'm not sure I can answer that question because that will require a lot of evolution on all people to accept because in Malaysia, to have an election, uh, to, to have a concept that an equality in the sense of the Western type of democracy, whether that will happen with the current structures which we have, with the current constraints we have, it is going to take a long, long time. So the other, re the other thing which we need to look into is the relevance of the collision of parties in this country and their strengths as we move forward. As we have already looked before, there were attempts for individual parties which can be said to be multiracial in nature. They came into the political arena, but by themselves, they could not be successful. We have met, I told you about the Independent Malaysia Party, subsequent parties, Democratic, even DAP, supposed to be multiracial, but has been given a racial identity. Grakan, supposed to be multiracial, also given a racial identity. So that being the scenario, whether such individual parties can actually form. So it, it's probably not possible. That's why you need to have a combination of multiple parties representing different racial groups and able to be traction to do this. So this coalition worked in, in, in the alliance very successfully to 1969. Then there was instability. Then another coalition took over in 1971 in the form of uh, Barisa National, also was successful until 2018. Then it also famed problem. And then a new coalition came in the form of Pakatan Harapan, didn't last too long. Now there's another coalition trying to form a coalition from Parikatan National, hasn't found its level of stability. So you see all the noises going on around, whether I will be with you, I will not be with you, you will be with me and all these kind of arguments. And this goes on. So how, so that is an important aspect of Malaysian politics. Leaving that aside, I just want to conclude what I'm trying to say in trying to examine whether these collisions are successful in achieving what they actually intended to achieve. In any form of collision politics, it's in Malaysia we call this what is called in Basa Malaysia we call it Kongsi Kwasa or sharing of power. When you share of power, is, the, is, this, is this sharing of power done on, on the ground rules which are gom, common to all components of this power sharing mechanism? I think this is important. Are they, are they sort of equally applied to all components of the power sharing mechanism? To assess the success of any one of this collision, one important question which has got to be answered, are all members of the collision equally successful? And when you measure the success, for example, the MCA and MIC, they represent the Chinese community and the Indian community. So when they are within the coalition, is by virtue of the presence within the coalition and the government, is the MCA able to garner the support of the Chinese community? Number two, is by virtue of being in the coalition, is the MIC being able to actually get the support of the Indian community? Then on an only day, then we'll say this coalition has been an effective coalition. But if you analyze that, over the years, the component parties of the collusion, particularly the non-Malay-based parties, particularly MCA and MIC, 
Although power was being shared at the top in terms of ministers, deputy ministers, state executive councillors, and the local council members, but what has happened over the years is there has been a distancing of the leadership with the community. There's been a distinction of the leadership from the community. That means the community support of these component parties has over the years become lesser and lesser. For example, in the last election, in 2018, 2018 election, uh, despite the MCA probably having about five ministers from 2013 to 2018 within the cabinet, the results of the 2018 election were quite a, a major shock because nearly 95% of the Chinese community actually voted against the Barisa National. So this shows there's a major disconnect between party leadership within the coalition and the support of the people from the ground. So this raises the question that whether this coalition has been efficient in strengthening all components within the coalition itself. Does the coalition strengthen all the members within the coalition? The answer is no. The answer is you no. Know, some components have become more stronger, while some components have continued to be weaker and weaker and weaker. So if you look at the, the just taking Barisa National as an example, the symbol of the Barisa National is the weighing machine, or what we call the Daqing in Barisa Malaysia. And the symbol shows, it's a straight line, it's a very balanced, balanced weighing machine. So while that is the symbol, but in reality, one have to ask whether it is actually balanced, or is that weighing machine in a state of disequilibrium. And, and unless and until there is an honest attempt to recognize this disequilibrium and identify the causes behind this disequilibrium and try to rectify it to do whatever has got to be done to make sure that all the components within the system are actually equally supported and moving forward together, then we will not be able to actually say this is an effective solution. I'm using it as an effective solution. I'm not saying it's an equal, equal participation because by its very formation, the equality is proportionate, but it has to be efficient. So there is this perception within the coalition itself of elements of inequality and inefficiency whereby the system allows strengthening one component while in essence it actually weakens the other components. So that is the, has been the unfortunate result and that is an antithesis of any form of coalition politics because the basis of coalition politics is everybody becomes equally successful. So when that doesn't happen then this is a question which we need to ask. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I think time is catching up. Uh, one issue which uh, we have to recognize, fortunately or unfortunately, the thread of race has been one main component of Malaysian politics from 1946, 1946 when Amno was first formed until today. And we all wait for the day where race will not be a component of the politics, where people will be judged by who they are and not what party they represent, and uh, whether and that particular day is going to become a reality sooner or in the, uh, or in the near future. And for that thing to happen, the evolution has to come not only from the top political leadership, but also has to come from the ground. Number two, 
although politi coalition politics might be the way of political stability in Malaysia, but then there has to be a relook examination on the management of these coalitions to ensure they're equally efficient, to make sure that all components are strengthened so all components can look forward and move forward in an equal manner, in a stable manner. And until this is achieved, then this degree of polarization which we see now will continue to exist. And I hope now we are in a very dynamic area of Malaysian politics. We have never seen so much movements or so much of dynamism in politics as we have seen in the recent few years. We hope after this period of instability, there will be a period of calm which will eventually come. And that period of calm will be much more stable than what it was been before. And the ideal aspects of what we all hope can be achieved. With those words, ladies and gentlemen, again I thank you, the organizers for having given me the opportunity to come here and talk to you. And uh, let us hope that democracy in Malaysia will continue to be vibrant, alive, and achieve the real spirit of that the individual citizens of this country will be able to decide correctly for the future of our country in the correct and effective manner. Thank you.